I believe Jesus is our hermeneutic, our methodology of interpretation. Jesus, the revelation of perfect love, love in human form, sovereign love, living, breathing, releasing grace and mercy, showing us what it looks like to live secure as a child of the King, dying, rising from the dead so that we too could have access to the same intimacy that he had access to. Jesus, the, the, the one who only did what he saw his father doing, the one who only said what he heard his father saying, Jesus is our hermeneutic. Amen? Hear me as I speak very carefully. I believe the entire Bible is the inspired Word of God. I love every part of it. Absolutely. But I want to tell you that if you don't have Jesus as the beginning, the end, and everything in between and everything after, if the revelation of sovereign love isn't your hermeneutic, you can get sideways reading the Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, not Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Jesus actually told us, John 5, He says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. He's talking to the, the, the Pharisees who have a hermeneutic that is biblical but isn't Jesus. It's really important that Jesus is our hermeneutic, that he is our lens, that he is our filter. Because if he isn't, you can find yourself back reading Job and get really confused about the nature of God. This is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. The subject of how to interpret the Bible. Uh, it's a subject that I am not nearly scholarly enough to address from that perspective. I want to just tell you how I've journeyed personally in my life and, and how um, this journey um, has been so transformative regarding, regarding how to read the Bible. Years ago, um, one of my heroes in the faith, Bill Johnson, um, made a statement, and it really was a statement that is kind of a no-brainer but, but it was like a aha moment for me, a, a revelatory moment. Uh, he said, Jesus is perfect theology. <clears throat> That's not, uh, in one sense, uh, that profound. However, in the context of my upbringing, in the context of the church today, uh, it actually is quite profound, uh, especially in the context of interpreting the Bible. Uh, if you interpret the Bible biblically, you can come to a whole bunch of conclusions if you interpret the Bible through Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection. Uh, all of a sudden, um, you've got the lens by which to understand the Bible, by which to read the Bible, by which to value it. Jesus has to be <clears throat> the lens. Jesus is what God looks like, period. He has to be the lens. He has to be uh, the final, complete whole picture of what God is like and of what the relationship between God and uh, humankind is like. I remember the first time I read about how David won a battle against the Moabites. And after the battle, <clears throat> he made them, the Moabites, lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. <clears throat> when I finished reading this, I literally said out loud, and I did. I remember uh, the first time I read this a long time ago, I literally said out loud, and, and, and I'm not a cusser, uh, but I, I literally said out loud, what the hell? I was like, seriously? <laughs> and so I remember... I don't know why this one grabbed me, because you can read throughout all the Old Testament. You can find this stuff. It's, it's littered with these kind of stories. But, but David's life was so cataloged and so well explained, and there seemed to be cause and effect, and there was always a lesson in it. And so this one, I was like, uh, it, it seemed just like, like the writer just was like, oh, by the way, there was this uh, battle with the Moabites, and David killed two-thirds of them. 
through this m most abstract um, approach. And I couldn't find, I, I, I tried to figure out what, what was this about? I couldn't find anything to explain what had come before. There's a little bit of thoughts, of, but, but nothing to explain it and, and no God story to tell us why David had done it. Did he get instruct instructions? Did an angel come to him and tell him, no, nope. just uh, <clears throat> seemed to have an idea and, and ran with it. The story is just a paragraph. This story is just a paragraph in the many chapters of David's incredible life. A, a seemingly insignificant footnote, unless you're a Moabite. <clears throat> then it's a story of horrifying slaughter, right? And oddly, the author apparently didn't feel the need to enlighten us. This cold-blooded brutality, this, this almost casual annihilation of entire people groups, it's everywhere in the Old Testament. And what's most disconcerting, as often as not, God seems to be credited as the primary instigator. It doesn't, doesn't take much for you to, to find evidences of, of, of mass um, destruction in the name of God. Some of it horrific. Moses writes about it a good deal. In fact, he's the guy who penned the famous story of Noah and you know the story. It's, it's the one where God seems keen on killing everyone. <clears throat> Genesis 5, 6 through 8, the Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth. Huh. Man. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, this is what the Lord said. Talk about a sovereign control lens established deeply within the psyche of the writer, that he is writing on behalf of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. This is in our Bibles. I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, what did they do? And the creatures that move along the ground. For I, this is the word of the Lord in, this, in the Bible. For I regret that I have made them. What the hell? <laughs> <coughs> the Old Testament is littered with stories like this. Stories where humanity is depraved and God is angry and destruction is imminent and then often realized. And then to the wonder and eternal gratitude of all of us, Jesus is introduced into the narrative. <clears throat> and with his arrival, God's thoughts about us suddenly seem to change. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 22.22, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. And yet in the New Testament, when you see in John 8, 11, a woman is caught in adultery and she's thrown at Jesus' feet. He says, neither do I condemn you. And he forgives her. In the Old Testament, if you look at Psalms 5, 5, it says that God hates all who do wrong. He hates all who do wrong. And that's all of us. Hates. And in the New Testament, he's fellowshipping with us, with the sinners, with the worst of the worst. He dined with us, and he laughed, and he cried with us, and he delivered us, and he healed us, and he saved us. I can't think of any stories where he's killing us. Didn't happen, not even once. So, I'm not the first person to notice that the God of the Old Testament seems to be a very different God than the one Jesus revealed in the New the disparity is enough to make one think for a long time he's been seriously manic or he is fickle, changing like the wind. But then we read Malachi 3.6 where he says, uh, where it says, I, the Lord, do not change. So then we're left with the question, if God didn't change, what did? Well, I would like to propose to you that what changed was our lens, perspective. Bill Johnson tells a story like this. There was a pastor who was building a church, and uh, he wasn't a, a carpenter. And the thing was building, he was really excited, and he was really excited to be a part of this thing. And, and so uh, the, finally the, the, the contractor said, tell you what, um, 
on the weekend, Friday, it was late in the day. He said, tell you what, here's some boards. Here's 100 boards. Uh, I need them eight feet. That's 96 inches, right? Eight feet, 96 inches. I need you to cut these boards eight feet. I need 100 of them cut. The pastor's really excited. So he, he cuts, everyone leaves. He takes that first board, takes a tape measure. He measures 96 inches. Boom, cuts that board. He takes the next board, puts it on, takes the board he's just cut, lays it over as a measuring stick. He uses that board. He cuts it. Now he takes the one, that one, he removes it. He takes the board he's just cut, and he takes another board. He uses the, the second board he's cut. He uses that as a measurement. Does that make sense? And on he goes, on he goes. You know what happens? By the time he's done, he has 10-foot boards. Right? Because it would have worked if he'd used the first board on every one, but the saw blade is about an eighth of an inch thick. And so every board got an eighth of an inch thicker and an eighth of an inch longer. Does that make sense? By the time he got to 100, he was way off eight feet. If Jesus isn't our hermeneutic, we'll find ourselves way off the measurement. I think it is of utmost importance that we have our hermeneutic correct. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the earth, and for the first time we saw God as he truly was. Jesus is perfect theology. And God was way different than we thought. He wasn't a controlling deity disappointed by our stumbling. You know, Jesus didn't come to show us how much we needed him. That was evident. He came to show us what it looks like to live confident as a son or a daughter. He didn't seem outraged. God didn't seem outraged by our brokenness, by our, by our sins, or by our sense of distance and separation. God wasn't in a bad mood. In fact, he seemed to be in a good mood. How surprising. He wasn't angry, at least not in the vengeful way that the writers of the Old Testament seemed to portray him. He didn't smite anyone, didn't even seem to want to. Yeah, he strongly addressed lack of faith. Yes, he challenged all humanity to wholehearted surrender. And yes, one time he even used a whip to drive the moneylenders out of the temple grounds. But there were no deaths, not even a report of injury. He was going after something else there. So don't get me wrong, Jesus did get angry. But when Jesus was angry, it was with the religious leaders the self-righteous who sought control <clears throat> like the drug that it is, who wielded control, the self-serving who used the theology of control, of good and evil, the ideology of good and evil to oppress others, to create an us and them system, an elitist uh, way by which to approach life. Those who shamed and condemned in his name those who wielded control like a sword. Yet while he used some strong language, even when confronting or describing uh, these fellows, he used like brood of vipers, blind guides, fools, and most definitely hypocrites. Even then, he never once followed it up with a killing spree. If you're going to be offended, you're only allowed to be offended if you're also willing to die for them. When Jesus died, he said, Father, forgive them, all of them, including, including the brood of vipers. Just a, a thought. Basically, if you're going to call somebody a name, make sure you're willing to die for them first. Jesus never once had people put down in the dirt, divided into thirds, and then had two out of every three slaughtered where they lay. There's no stories like that in the Gospels. I checked. The stories of God and mass killings seem to be missing from the four Gospels, the four books of which God is most clearly d revealed, defined, shown. Oddly, the clearest revelation of God, the perfect picture of sovereignty. If you want to know what sovereignty looks like, Jesus is what it looks like seems to be missing the angry, murderous, destructive bent. The Gospels don't have any of it in them. And no one understood it. And to this day, we're still wrestling with it. Jesus lived absolutely counter to religious culture. 
he turned the world upside down. The last were first, the poor were, were rich, the meek inherited the earth, the weak became strong, sinners were loved, prostitutes forgiven, and willing or willful prodigals greeted with a kiss. None of it made sense. Jesus, revealing God for who he truly is, walked as the perfect expression of sovereign love. He was revealing the paradigm of sovereign love. He was revealing the paradigm of, of grace. And everyone was baffled by it. And I would like to propose that the reason no one could truly comprehend was because all humanity wore colored glasses. All humanity uh, had a flaw on their lens regarding the nature of God. They saw everything, including Jesus, through the lens of sovereign control. You know, the, the reality is, is control. It was the prevailing perspective since the fall. Sovereign control, us and them, good and evil. It was the prevailing perspective. It was the prevailing perspective since the fall. It was the prevailing perspective while the Bible was being written, the Old Testament was being written. Even Jesus' disciples, those who had never once witnessed Jesus do anything that smacks remotely of genocide, were looking at the world and looking at God and the world through the sovereign control lenses. In Luke 9, 51 through 56, when the, when the days were approaching for his ascension, Jesus, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. The disciples went into this little Samaritan village just on the way to Jerusalem for Jesus. And, and they, they rejected the disciples and they rejected Jesus. And the, and the two fellows, James and John, came back to Jesus and they went, hold on. They, they talked to each other and they said, that whatever we tell them, it needs to be biblical. And so they started to work their way through the Bible and they went, oh, I got it. And so they presented a biblical idea to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, let's rain down fire on the city. Jesus said, that might be biblical, but it's nothing like me. You know not what spirit you're of. You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man, get this, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. If you want the clearest understanding regarding God's heart for humanity, this scripture is a good place to start. <clears throat> I, I, I sincerely mean this. And this scripture right here, I, I think honestly, uh, if you wanted to have a, a particular lens, and if you wanted to know my particular lens, it's, it's really this, uh, that the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That as hard as it none would perish, and here it is. Long ago, I made Jesus sovereign love my hermeneutic. I made him my methodology of interpretation, the lens through which my entire theology is, is defined. It's also how I read the Bible. Jesus says to his, his hellfire disciples, is Jesus like, you're the spirit. You don't know what spirit you're of. Guys, the spirit behind your desire to see fire rained down upon people is, is, is broken. <clears throat> it's from the pit of hell. It's absolutely contrary to my nature. It's actu actually against what I've come to do. And Jesus continued on his way to Jerusalem and he completely changed the way we could know what God looked like and acted like. No longer do we have to interpret him through a theology of control, through his death and resurrection. We could now know him through the revelation of love. Here's my point, guys. Jesus revealed a truer narrative. He, he revealed a truer paradigm. And with it, humanity gained access to the whole story. Jesus revealed sovereign love. We can now truly see God from Old Testament through to the New. We can now truly discover sovereignty. We can truly trust him. We can truly be free. My point, it wasn't God that changed from Old Testament to new. It was our perspective. Or more accurately, our perspective can change. 
if we choose to make Jesus, sovereign love, the lens or the author and perfecter of our faith, if we choose to make Jesus our hermeneutic. And so uh, if I, in, in the old days when I was reading uh, Old Testament, I'd be reading scripture and, and I'd begin to get unnerved or, or, or feel tension regarding the nature of God. I'd made a decision that if I was going to have tension, it will not be regarding what I believe about his love for me. If there's going to be tension, it will not be on the nature of God revealed by Jesus. It will be on my understanding of the Old Testament scripture. And I'd rather there be tension on my understanding of Old Testament scripture than on the nature of God and his thoughts about me revealed perfectly through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Because one will undermine everything. The other is just my understanding of, of some words on a page. One will affect my intimacy. The other is simply about understanding. All scripture is meant to point towards Jesus. Old Testament and New. I read certain passages in the New Testament where people want to argue uh, the nature of God and redefine the nature of God again outside of what it looks like with regarding Jesus' particular stories in the New Testament. And I've done the same thing with the New Testament. I'm like, look, Jesus said, I've come to save men's lives, not destroy them. Jesus literally died for all humanity and rose. And in his resurrection, we all rose with him. He has not come to destroy us. He is always good. For me, interpreting the Old Testament outside of the revelation of Jesus is to completely miss the point. It's, it's absolutely foolish. I'm convinced that Jesus is the lens by which we interpret the Old Testament and the New. And I have discovered that when I read through the lens of sovereign love, suddenly a story about a flood that wipes out all nearly all of humanity doesn't make me desperate or insecure. See, here's the fun thing about this lens, this, this, this foundational approach to reading scripture. As I, would, as I would read the Old Testament, I would begin to see Jesus in the Old Testament, and I would begin to get revelation like I would have never been able to get before because my, my lens had been adjusted, it had been corrected. I was looking for, for the savior of the world. I was looking for sovereign love all the way through the narrative. And so suddenly you read a story about Noah and you're not unnerved by it. I wasn't, un oh, here's where he's moving. I'm not unnerved by Noah anymore because I can see what God is doing, what he's speaking, and what he's, what he's releasing. Moses is the fellow credited to have most likely written what would have already been the age-old story of Noah, a story that had been orally passed down from generation to generation. <clears throat> Moses was 100, and get this, because this is uh, important. Uh, Moses was 100% inspired of God when he wrote the first five books regarding the relationship between God and man. And what Moses wrote was an absolutely true story. And I'm not getting into the... Scholars can have a better time with this. I'm saying that it was true. I believe the Bible was inspired by God. I believe you can trust it. But I would like to suggest it was not the whole story. Moses didn't have the whole story yet. He wasn't looking at God and man through the perfect lens of sovereign love. <clears throat> the lens revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Moses, he didn't have the Gospels. Therefore, while Moses' perspective was fully inspired by God, was powerful and good, I would like to propose it was not definitive, it was not complete. When it comes to Noah's story, God inspired Moses and Moses interpreted the inspiration. And I would like to suggest that Moses had a theology, a context, a paradigm, a narrative, a lens, sovereign control. His perspective was good and evil. In the sovereign control narrative of Moses' day, it was determined that if you touched a leper, you were made unclean. In the sovereign love narrative, Jesus revealed the whole story. When he touched a leper, the leper was made clean. In the control perspective 
of Moses' day, punishment was the language of God. Moses captured this well when he wrote on God's behalf, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. However, Jesus revealed the whole story, a truer perspective, the language of forgiveness and redemption. He said, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Here's what I'm trying to convey. Moses had a perspective on the nature of God, good and evil, sovereign control. He described it truly, but not definitively, not completely. He captured the problem, but not the solution. He wrote down the story, but it wasn't the whole story. And then Jesus came and gave us perfect 2020 vision regarding what God is like, sovereign love. And Jesus also made it clear how to read the whole Bible. Listen, you study the scriptures because you think in them is eternal life, but they testify of me. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And he wasn't talking about the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. He was specifically addressing how they interpret the Old Testament. His point was that scripture wasn't the answer. It pointed to the answer. And he was also making it clear he was that answer. Jesus is the word made flesh. John 1, 4. Jesus is the word made flesh. We live in a culture today that has deified the Bible. I don't know how many conversations I've had, particularly on, on some, uh, some tougher subjects in the last months, where people have wanted to disagree with me biblically, and in their disagreement with me biblically, have also disagreed with what Jesus looks like. Because their hermeneutic was biblical, but wasn't Christ-like. The idea that the Bible is somehow God has crept in to our, our thinking. And, and so we, we, we suddenly uh, are, are, are interpreting the nature of God using Job and Jesus equally. And man, that gets confusing because Job was the question and Jesus is the answer. So you start to get that in your bones. You start to read all scripture looking for the goodness of God, looking through the lens of sovereign love. And suddenly you start reading uh, about Noah and you say, what if we read the story of Noah through the interpretation of Jesus? What if we applied God's heart, not to destroy men's lives, but to save them to that epic tale? Is it possible we might see it differently? What if the depravity of sin was so devastating in Noah's day that humanity and innocence was being consumed? What if, <clears throat> Genesis 6, 5, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time? What if the earth was corrupt and full of violence? And what if, like Paul notes in Romans 8, all creation groaned under the weight of sin and death? What if the actual earth is affected? by sin? What if this groaning of a broken and fallen earth erupted in the form of an all-consuming flood? What if God in his saving mercy gave humanity, and this is pretty profound, a 120-year warning by sending a message to the one man on the planet who was living in such a way that he could hear it? What if for the next 120 years, that's how long it took Noah to, to build the ark, Noah built an ark by God's instruction, grace, and provision? What if the feat uh, was an act of faith like none before seen on the planet? His faith on display. And still, no, soft, no heart softened. What if the construction was supernaturally ahead of its time and design and engineering, which we understand it was? What if the people lived in the shadow of this magnificent testimony of God's desire to save them for 120 years and yet not one person repented, not one heart softened? And what if the people who would have humbled themselves and prayed, and that's 2 Chronicles 7.14, one of my favorite scriptures, and if the people would have humbled themselves and prayed and sought his face and turned from their wicked ways, what if... What if they'd done that? Would it have been possible that he would have forgiven their sin and healed their land? Which is what the scripture says. If my people will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wickedness, turn from those, their ways, then I will 
then I will forgive their sins and heal them. Then, then the response is that the, the land itself would be healed. What if God, who was perfectly revealed in Jesus, does not change? What if it, was, it has never been his heart to destroy men's lives, and it has always been his heart to save them, even during the time of Noah's flood? Listen, Noah's story is incredible. He lived faithfully obedient in the context of sovereign control. But I want to highlight the difference between Noah's navigation of a flood and, and how we've been invited to navigate a flood today. See, if you read about Noah and you read and you don't read through the lens of sovereign love, you're going to come to a very different conclusion on how to live life today than if you read about Noah and you read it through the lens of sovereign love. So I want to, I want to suggest that the clarity of our perspective determines everything. Noah's lens on God was not definitive. He did not have the revelation of Christ, a redeemed perspective, the whole story. For Noah, God was sovereignly in control, and in a control narrative, the flood was perceived as God's wrathful punishment of a horrendously sinful people. It was something that was deserved and something to be survived. What does a man of faith in a control narrative do when an angry God desires to destroy everything with a flood? He faithfully and obediently works night and day on his salvation with one fearful eye always searching the sky. He builds a boat and prays he survives the coming destruction. I know many believers who serve a God in control, a God they perceive as angry and wrathful, a God who seeks to punish sin with destruction or hell. They work day and night on their salvation. They live fearfully, one eye always searching the sky for signs of humanity's impending doom. And their prayer life consists of desperate pleas for a stay of execution. They're, they're less saints and more survivors. And I've, I've lived some of this in my own life, areas of my life where I was less a saint and more a survivor. He's trying to make it through. Listen, I'm not suggesting Noah got it wrong. The Bible's true. The Old Testament's true. But it's not the whole story. So I'm not suggesting that Noah got it wrong. In the narrative of his day, he actually knocked it out of the park. But I am suggesting if we today perceive God through the same lens the same control lens that Noah did, we will live in the same narrative. Have you ever wondered why we have a Christian subculture in America? I would like to suggest it's because much of the church still interprets God and man through the lens of sovereign control. Therefore, when it gets darker in the world, and there's a whole part of Christianity that's talking about how it's getting darker and darker, and as it gets darker, we don't get brighter, uh, instead, we build a subculture. We build a. We become survivors. We build some sort of ark to survive the coming flood, and we build an eschatology to serve this same. Uh, yeah, I'm not going there. But I would like to suggest that if a flood were prophesied today, building an ark to survive it would be counter to the gospel of Jesus. So I did go there. See, we have the whole story. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Christians aren't called to fear floods, guys. We aren't called to survive them. We're called to live like Jesus, to release his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We are called to overcome, to break through, to live as expressions of sovereign love. We have the whole story. And in Christ, we can live in such a powerful, surrendered way that floods must bend the knee. Like we're living in the whole story. And if we're willing to walk away from the ideology of sovereign control and make Jesus sovereign love, our lens, our hermeneutic, our methodology of interpretation, we will become a church that doesn't fear floods. Instead, floods will fear us. Get this. I, I mean, I, we, aren't, we aren't here to call down fire. We're not here to build some subculture, some Christian subculture so we can survive a boat for a world-ending flood on earth as it is in heaven. That's the mandate. And Jesus said, even greater works will you do. And it wasn't a good idea. He was looking into the future and he saw sons and daughters confident in his sovereign love, living as an expression of his kingdom come. He saw them doing greater works. 
Here's the thing. Noah couldn't do something. And I get this. Noah couldn't do something outside his theology. But the point isn't that Noah couldn't do something outside of his theology. The point is, is we can't do anything outside of our theology. And if we have a survivor theology, then we will be survivors. If God is sovereignly in control, then we are just doing our best to make it through, to build the boat, to make it through. It becomes our lens on everything, including how we live our days right through to the end. Sovereign control is the smallest, the narrowest lens through which to know God. It's salvation through works. It takes the least amount of faith and doesn't take into account God's eternal and sovereign love. To describe God as sovereignly in control is an earthbound perspective. It doesn't include heaven's perspective. It is finite thinking dictated by the fear of coming floods. A God in control is human reasoning. While it may seem to be an accurate assessment of our experience, while it may appear true from where we are standing, it is not the truth that sets us free. Sovereign control is not in God's nature. It's in man's perspective. It only works outside the revelation of perfect love and the context of eternity. We need a better perspective. We need a better way to read the Bible. If you read the Bible through the lens of sovereign control, you'll find a God who's sovereignly in control and you'll live a very small life, a very small, very fear-based life. And us and them, good and evil, limited gospel, sometimes good God life. But he is sovereign love. He is the whole story. When the Bible is interpreted through Jesus, when he's our hermeneutic, when our perspective comes into alignment with his, we join in the whole story and we begin to live sure in the power of our salvation, in the power of resurrection life.